Okay, well every blessing to you all and uh, welcome back to my open air pulpit. Still very nice for late August. It's a very hot day today, but I wanted to take some time out and uh, make a video and as always cover subjects which are of importance to me. I'm still very much watching the Middle East and uh, it beggars belief really of the continual ignorance and almost collusion, I guess, of the secular press and the apostate churches completely failing to delve deep into what is actually going on in the Middle East. Whether it's Syria, whether it's Egypt, churches are being burnt down, Christians are being persecuted, in some cases even raped and killed. And the secular press, for the most part, is totally silent on what's going on. There was a chemical attack this week just outside of Damascus and some groups are saying that it was the Syrian government, other groups are saying it was the rebels. Does it really matter? Sin is sin. Somebody once said that war is God's judgment on sin here. Hell is God's judgment on sin hereafter. The Lord, as you all well know by now, if you've ever read the Word of God, does punish people. He does allow unsaved people to kill unsaved people and sometimes he will use unsaved people to chastise and sometimes even kill saved people. If you belong to the Lord and you are out of fellowship with the Lord, he may send an adversary to chastise you. The Word of God is littered with accounts of people that were saved that were walking with the Lord but for whatever reason they fell away, didn't repent and sin came their way. It happened with Solomon. Solomon gave in to uh, polygamy and idolatry and other sins of the flesh and the Lord stirred up an adversary against Solomon. The Lord is a holy God, he's a righteous God, he does not accept sin and if you're saved, if you're one of his people, he will never ever sit back and allow you to delve in your own private sin. I'm going to call this video, Whatever Happened to Sin? because we don't hear much about sin anymore. You find a lot of these churches trying to drum up support, trying to get people to join the memberships, sit in their pews and make this a better world, so-called. And yet, why would you become a Christian if there was no hell? Why would you want to join an organization if there was no punishment? A lot of these groups are based on tithes. These groups can't exist without people financially supporting them. And so how, how incredulous I was to watch a debate not very long ago, a leading Catholic uh, nun debating in a, it was a live TV audience and the subject of, of the discussion was, uh, does God exist? Question mark. And I guess she was there to represent the Catholic Church, I guess. She's quite well known in the UK. And... Uh, she was the only one from the Catholic Church there. I can't remember if anybody from any other denomination or group or organisation was there, but she represented the harlot, the woman on the Seven Hills. And uh, she was sitting next to an atheist, and uh, this rather smug character was quite proud and arrogant how he didn't believe in the Lord and how he was going to do his own thing, which is fine. The Lord many times just sits back and lets people do what they want to do. It's very rare, I might just add, for the Lord to directly intervene and kill people or kill an individual. It's very rare. Yes, it happens in the Bible. Many times the Lord uh, dealt with his own people harshly and firmly and fairly and he stepped in and he just took out 10, 20, 30, 40,000 people. They were children of Israel, but they weren't born again, of course. They were the tares. They were the mixed multitude which left Egypt. But it's rare. I will say this one more time. It is very rare for the Lord to intervene. He is a very patient and long-suffering God. He's not willing that any should perish but they all should come to repentance. But anyhow, back to this debate, it was interesting to watch uh, how she was trying to argue that if you are an atheist, it's okay, the Lord's still gonna receive you. When you die, you're gonna go to heaven anyway. She told a bald-faced lie. She lied to the man sitting next to her. She lied to the audience watching, and she blasphemed the Lord God. If you're not a believer, you're not gonna go to heaven when you die. It's as simple as that. If you're not born again, you're lost. And if you're lost, you're gonna go to hell. You wouldn't wanna go to heaven. Let's be honest, if you are not born again, why would you want to spend eternity in heaven worshipping Jesus forever? Why would you want to go to heaven and be with the brethren, worshipping the Lord forever? But she sat there 
as if butter wouldn't melt, trying to make, make the argument that the Lord will take atheists, agnostics, Hindus, Muslims, Freemasons, blah blah blah, they're all good to go. Complete folly. And this is one of the biggest problems of the Catholic Church since the Second Vatican Council. The Catholic Church, as you all well know, speaks out of both sides of the mouth. When she's talking to an audience in the West, she's ecumenical, she's all things to all people, she's completely uh, inclusive, but when she talks to Catholics in Latin America, it's a different ballgame. And when she's referring to born-again Christians, ex-Catholics in Latin America, they're cursed. They are completely cursed, they are anathema, and they are written off. And so from October the 1st, we are going to be broadcasting on shortwave radio. And one part, one of the uh, parts of the world we're going to be broadcasting to, Lord willing, is going to be Catholic Latin America. Keep us in prayer. That's still an ongoing endeavour, but we are 99% ready to start broadcasting from the 1st of October. It will be great to try and reach some of these Catholic people. Uh, I appreciate that Spanish and Portuguese and other uh, foreign languages are very much... Uh, endemic in Latin America, but uh, some of them do speak English, so Lord willing, our messages will get through to some of those Catholics. And the Word of God says that His Word doesn't return void, so whatever you do for the Lord, do something, and it won't be wasted. But like I say, watching this debate, she was quite clear, atheists go to heaven, and this smug atheist was sort of laughing away, well I don't believe in that, or if you say so, you know, it's going to be okay, you know, blah blah blah, it's complete nonsense. If you're not born again, you're lost. It's as simple as that. God is not going to allow anyone or anything into his presence which hasn't been regenerated. Look at the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what he went through to secure our salvation. Was that all in vain? Yes, he's made an atonement for everybody. He's made uh, an appropriate... Uh, an, uh, he's provided an atonement for everybody, but you have to receive that atonement. Never mind saying, well, you know, I just trust in my family, or I just trust in my... Uh, church to get me to heaven. That's not how it works. The atonement was provided by the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's only going to be of importance to you. It's only going to be of relevance to you when you reach out and grab it. He provided it, but you have to appropriate it. There's no other way to be saved. There's no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. Jesus Christ, he's the only way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. But anyway, like I said, I'm going to call this video uh, Whatever Happened to Sin. Because we don't hear a lot of it these, uh, discussed these days. We hear a lot of talk about trying to make this world a better place and trying to come together and trying to create this, you know, one world religion, one world society, blah, blah, blah. It's all a hoax, of course. They're not interested in born again Bible believers. Any other religion, any other group, any other type of people are welcomed into this inclusive one world system. But your born again Bible believer is persona non grata. They don't want you, they're not interested in you. It's like when you go back to the Catholic Church. You've got all these Marian shrines. The Marian shrines are no threat to other religions. Muslims and Hindus are quite happy to pay homage to Mary. But of course the Lord Jesus is a divisive character. Hence why you don't find any so-called shrines dedicated to the Lord Jesus. They're all Marian shrines. And you know Mary's going to be very much used in the last days to pull all these groups together. But anyway, because some scriptures I want to look at today. And you know, you can make videos like this. You can come up here in a beautiful summer's day and talk about the things of the Lord and offer your thoughts and have a, a bit of a semi-rant, a semi rant, as I'm known to do. And uh, we are, you know, from time to time able to share our own thoughts and views. Even all the busy uh, motorbikes behind me, please excuse them, they are quite noisy today. Uh, but, every, every, you know, every so often, back to the Bible, what does the Word of God say? My views, for the most part, are just my own views. You know, I don't offer myself as a prophet. I'm just an ordinary guy. I'm nothing special. I'm just an ordinary self-taught Bible believer. And I could talk forever about politics and music and other things that you know, I take an interest in. But really, what it comes down to is what does the Bible actually say? My view is irrelevant. Your, your view is irrelevant. What does the scripture say? And of course, in the ecumenical movement, nobody questions anyone. How can they? Everyone's truth is equal. But God hates it. God despises false truth. He despises false religions. And like I say, this, uh, this nun, I should say, did a huge disservice. I'm not surprised, of course. She's not saved. She's in a false church. And, uh, you know, when she dies, she'll stand in the presence of the Lord at the great white throne. She'll realise just how foolish she was. And all those smug atheists who uh, are pushing this science museum 
they'll stand as well. They'll stand as well next to her at the Great White Throne, and they'll be condemned to hell for all of eternity. It goes back to the Middle East. You've got unsaved people killing unsaved people. Where do we come into this? Where does a born again Christian come into this? We're told to pray for those in authority. We're told to reach out to the lost uh, men and women. We start in our own families, we start in our workplaces, and then we reach out to our neighbours and to the wider community. But this is God's judgment. This is one of the reasons why this is a fallen world. And there's no point trying to fix these solutions, there's no point trying to send charities into these war-torn countries, whether it's Libya, Libya's still in a mess, whether it's Iraq, Iraq's still in a mess, Afghanistan, that war was never going to be won in the first place. Um, and that looks like there's going to be some kind of Western involvement in Syria. Why? Why are we getting involved with Syria? Let the Islamic countries deal with Syria. Let the Islamic countries deal with what's left of Libya and Iran and all these other problematic countries which keep springing up. Because let's get, it, let's get this quite straight. Once you deal with these secular governments, these sort of uh, pseudo-Islamic uh, governments that rule, uh, rule these countries, what are you going to put in its, in its place? What are you going to replace it with? Not the Bible. This book is banned in most Islamic countries. You're going to get the Quran, you're going to get the Hadith, and you're going to get Sharia law. And if you've ever studied these things, you know that the Sharia law, fundamentalist Islam, is against the West, big time. This country is full of people that are just waiting and ready to go. And I mentioned this in my last video, how you've got this sort of Islamic iron curtain which is suppressing Bible-believing Christians all over the Middle East. And for some reason, and of course we know why, but uh, however they justify, I don't know, but for whatever reason the secular press won't delve into it. And they'll be judged for that. They have the ability to expose what's going on here, but they won't touch it with a barge pole because it's hot stuff. It's controversial, and people don't want to be seen to be controversial. Most people want to be most people want to be liked. Let's be quite honest. If you are born again Bible believing Christian, you want to be liked. And the last thing you want to be seen is to rock the boat. And that's why most Christians are sitting their hands. Most believers don't really want to get involved. You know, they sort of give you a half. Uh, they give you half of their support. You know, they sort of raise an eyebrow sometimes if it's a really controversial subject. But uh, they won't delve into it. They won't deal with it. They won't look at it. And that's why I said to you in our last video, keep praying for the, the brethren in the Middle East. You know, they must feel exposed, they must feel isolated, uh, and they must feel many times completely forgotten. But we are with you, we're standing with you. And like I said last time, one of our goals for late 2013 and maybe early, uh, early 2014 will be to reach into the Middle East through shortwave radio. We're going to start small and we're going to build up. We're going to hit Latin America first of all. We're going to hit the Caribbean and North America. But I'll touch on that much more in a future video. I'm just trying to look at uh, other areas of interest to me today. Because, as I say, few people you know, are discussing these subjects. Few people are prepared to actually take a stand and look at what the Word of God says. Whatever happens to sin? What does the Word of God say about sin? Sin is real. Sin isn't just some philosophy. Never mind all these Catholics and so-called Protestants uh, spiritualizing the Bible and saying, well, there's no such thing as sin or there's no such place as hell. Never mind these charlatans, these liars, these fools. What does the scripture say about sin? Look at Matthew's Gospel. Let's start at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, when the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking. And if he doesn't know what sin is all about, nobody knows what sin is all about. Matthew 15, look at verse 19. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. Whatever you eat makes no difference. It doesn't commend you to the Lord. It doesn't drive you away from the Lord. There's no dietary restrictions today. You can eat whatever you want to eat. But he's looking much beyond just food or washing hands. This goes back to the, the Pharisees trying to pull him apart, trying to find fault with him. And he says, from the heart proceeds evil thoughts. And he starts right at the very beginning, murders. That's the second to first sin in the Old Testament. The first sin in the Old Testament was Satan using knowledge to trick Eve and subsequently Adam. But the second sin of the Bible was murder. Cain killed Abel. He says murders. If you just think in your heart to do someone harm, if you despise someone, if you hate 
your fellow brother or sister in the Lord. According to 1 John chapter 3, you are a murderer, and no murderer has everlasting life abiding in them. Adulteries, that's broad. If you just look to lust at a woman, or if you're a woman lusting after a man, that constitutes adultery, according to Matthew chapter 5. Fornications, that's all premarital sex. And that word for fornication is poinia, which is where we get the word for pornog pornography from. And that's a pretty broad and endemic problem. Not only men battle pornography, women do as well. Also with adulteries, if you've got person A and person B that are married and they've got children, and person C comes along and starts to have an affair, that's the word they like to use now, affair. It's not an affair. It's adultery, and God hates it. But if you've got person A and person B with children, and person C comes along and gets involved with, say, person A, the children are the first to suffer. The children are going to be scarred forever. I knew a brother years ago told me that when his marriage broke down, his children suffered terribly for it. And he said to me, it was the equivalent of child abuse. And he's probably right. But uh, you're going to scar your children. Is it really worth it? Fornications, that covers everything. Like I say, pornography, lusting, men and women battle with that. Uh, it can also cover not just infidelity, but perversion within that. It can also, look, it can also cover areas within uh, incest, bestiality, and uh, paedophilia. What else does he say here? Thefts, stealing, all forms of stealing is an abomination to the Lord. If you download music off the internet, if you download films off the internet, if you copy uh, computer software programs, that's stealing. And the Lord says that's evil. False witness. Yeah, I saw this. You didn't really say, did you? No, I didn't really. You're lying. Be honest with yourself. Don't give a false testimony. Blasphemies. That is really endemic. When you hear people saying, oh my, and then the, the Lord's name follows, or Jesus, and they say Christ. Blasphemy. I've seen professing Christians blaspheme the Lord. I've heard preachers blaspheme the Lord. Not just, oh my God, in a sort of reverential sense, but oh my, and then expression it in a sense of disgust. I've seen it. I've heard it. And I've been aware of these things for years. And the Lord says these are evil thoughts. It comes from the heart. The heart of man is desperately wicked. Until you're born again, your heart is desperately wicked. Hence why you need to be born again. All these false religions, all these philosophies coming together, trying to fix these situations, trying to make us a better world, they're kidding themselves. You can't fix yourself, you can't fix this world. Look at all these politicians around the world trying to fix these crises. They can't do it. Look at the Middle East, look at the United Nations, look at the European Union. All the best money, all the best brains, they can't fix the problems of the world. Like I said, the first thing in the Bible was Satan trying to deceive Adam and Eve through knowledge. He didn't come in a sort of... Uh, shining light, you came as a serpent. Something as simple as that. Something so simple caused our first parents to stumble. That's original sin. That hasn't been fixed. That's still very much a problem today. We still need to be born again. You can live the best life you want. You may make 80. You may make it to 90 years old, but you're still lust. You still have a sin problem. Your conscience tells you when you do wrong. This creation all around you that you can see on this video points to a creator. But people don't want to deal with it. People want to bury it. They say, well, you know, we can't prove there's a God. And they sort of run away. And they sort of deal with evolution. Or they deal with philosophy. Or they become pantheist. Or they become atheist or agnostic or whatever. And the Bible says this. The Bible says that man hates God. Man doesn't seek after God. He'll take everyone and anything instead of God. And I remember years ago, I listened to a preacher. made a very profound statement. He said, you can go anywhere in the world and speak to any group of people about almost any particular subject but the minute you mention Jesus Christ, the subject changes, the atmosphere changes. People don't want to hear it. See, Jesus is controversial. He's divisive. He did say, didn't he, he came with a sword to separate the family. He doesn't want to, uh, he doesn't expect people just to sit back and observe him. He expects people to believe on him. You can't sit on the fence when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. So one more time, you find murders adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. It's not a comprehensive list. You don't find paedophilia in there, although that would fit in under fornication, I believe. And people say, well, the Lord didn't condemn homosexuality. He didn't condemn explicitly people trafficking either. But would he have been for it? Of course not. Go to 1 Corinthians, please. The Apostle Paul speaking. And uh, forgive me, it's very windy today. So I hope you can hear me. 
1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul speaking. Let's start at verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God has two parts. The kingdom of God, first of all, is spiritual. If you're born again today, you are in the kingdom of God. And when you die, you go to the literal kingdom of God. And he says here, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. The unsaved person, the unsaved man or woman. Why would you want to go to heaven? Like I've already said to you, you don't love the Lord, you hate the Lord. Be honest with yourself. You want to go to hell, and that's where you're going to go. But Paul breaks it down. He says, be not deceived. Don't kid yourselves. This Catholic nun won't tell you this. Most of the vicars in this country won't tell you this. Most of the bishops won't tell you this. Most of the cardinals won't tell you this. But I'll tell you this. Paul says, neither fornicators. Once again, unsaved people, or even in some cases, saved people, living together and, and are not married. If you're living with someone who's not your husband, or if you're living with someone who's not your wife, get married. Stop defiling one another. God hates that. Fornicators aren't going to receive the kingdom of God. Idolaters, stop worshipping false gods. Worship the one true God of the Bible. Adulterers aren't going to make it. Why not? Because it's an abomination to the Lord. One man, one woman, until the end. No divorces and remarriages. Yes, the Lord allowed divorce on the grounds of infidelity, but that's it. That's it. People keep getting remarried two, three, four, five times. It's an abomination to the Lord, and he hates it. Nor effeminate, that's your homosexuality, lesbianism. Nor abusers of themselves and mankind, that could be uh, male and female prostitutes. The Bible's, uh, Bible's against that very clearly. Nor thieves, we looked at that just a few minutes ago. Nor covetous, don't covet something, don't lust for something which isn't yours. Be content with what you have. Drunkards, if you're an alcoholic, forget it, you're not going to make it. Nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But look at this, verse 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Don't be puffed up. Some of you people fit into those categories I've just given you. And there's nothing worse than meeting an arrogant, self-righteous, puffed up, holy and now Christian. God saved you by the skin of your teeth. So don't go around with a holy and now attitude. Humble yourself. You are on your way to hell before the Lord stepped in and saved you. And you want to save other people. The Bible says you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. People, like I said, are being killed in the Middle East every day of the week. Muslims killing Muslims, but the Lord doesn't sit back and enjoy that. People are dying around the world, but the Lord doesn't sit back and enjoy that. 150,000 people die every day, regardless of, war, of wars and uh, illnesses or what have you. He doesn't take any enjoyment in that, but he does execute judgment when he needs to. These people are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Unless you are born again, you're not going to make it, people. Go to Revelation, please. Revelation chapter 21. Let's see if your sins are in there. You might say he hasn't discussed my sins yet. Well, let's see that your sins are in here. Whatever happened to sin? What does John say about it? Revelation 21. Look at verse 8. But the fearful. Is that you? And unbelieving. Is that you? And the abominable. Is that you? And murderers. And whoremongers. These promiscuous men. These promiscuous women. They're called whoremongers. And sorcerers. There's your witchcraft. There's your occult. That covers a broad subject, uh, sorcery. And idolaters. Again, those who create false gods in their own image. And all liars. Just one lie, and you're a liar. These people shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Let's read that one more time. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murders and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That word should be murderers, by the way, not murders. Pretty bored, isn't it? Are you in one of those groups? Is your sin there? I bet it is. These people are going to go into the lake of fire, which is a second death. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine your worst enemy being evicted and put on the streets? That'd be pretty harsh, wouldn't it? Could you imagine your worst enemy finding out that one of their children has died? That's pretty harsh, isn't it? I wouldn't wish, I wouldn't wish that on any of my enemies. In fact, I haven't got any enemies, as far as I know. <laughs> I don't despise anybody. I'm sure there are people out there who don't like me but I don't hate anybody. I can't imagine my worst enemy 
having to suffer with the loss of a job, loss of a, loss of a loved one, loss of a house. I can't imagine it. And I wouldn't wish it on anyone. But you just saw from chapter 21, these people are going to go into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. It's a heavy message, isn't it? Why would you become a Christian if there's no hell? Why do people join the Jehovah's Witnesses? They don't believe in hell. Don't tell me something's a better world, because you haven't made it a better world. We've been around for 6,000 years, mankind. This is not a better world. There's still murder, there's still rape, there's still strife, there's still sin, there's still wickedness all around us. We've made very little difference. The best thing a saved person can do is reach out and try and get somebody else saved. We can't save people in and of ourselves, we know that, but the Lord uses us as postmen to reach out and deliver the letters, being the gospel, of course. What you do with that is completely up to you. Go to book of Numbers, please. I'm almost finished going through the Old Testament. And one thing I do find very interestingly is how the Lord allows sin to run its course. Like I say, it's very rare for him to step in and take someone's life. Yes, it happened. It happened with uh, Ananias and Sapphira. You know, and he, he put uh, Moses to death and Aaron and Miriam and other people. But by and large, the Lord allows people to run their course. And people can evolve into a way of life. No one's born a wicked uh, murderer or rapist. You know, people evolve into a way of life. But through original sin, everyone has the, the, the possibility, the potential, to be wicked, to be completely depraved. But uh, with society now the way that it is, it's kind of fashionable, isn't it, to be as depraved as you can. And if you watch a typical Hollywood film, and I don't suggest it, but if you do, it's getting more and more graphic, more and more violent, more and more blasph blasphemy in these films. They're constantly pushing the barriers. Push, push, push. Push the barriers. Try and contaminate as many people as you can. The devil knows his time is limited. And therefore the best way he can reach out to more people and take them to hell with him is through the media. The press aren't going to tell you anything. Whether it's the television or the print press, what do they know? The churches aren't going to tell you anything. They're too worried about uh, being kicked out of their churches. They're too, they're, they're terrified really, you know, of... Uh, Having the churches shut down, they're terrified of uh, being sacked, being laid off, being fired. We live in strange times. You know, I've seen so much change in my lifetime. You know, I'm not particularly old, but I've seen a lot of things change. You know, since I left school. This is the book of Numbers. It's getting a bit windy now, so I hope you can still all hear me. When you get saved, one thing happens to you. Uh, the Lord gives you His righteousness. You receive His imputed righteousness. And about 85% of professing churches, if you don't know this, don't believe that you're saved through Christ's imputed righteousness. They actually reject that. They teach that you are saved through uh, being baptised, going to church, being a good boy or girl, uh, receiving the sacraments, and hoping for the best. That's called infused righteousness. And 85% of churches, not Catholic, but churches generally, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, you name them, 85% of those churches believe that you become a Christian and you start off as a Christian through infused righteousness, but you're not guaranteed salvation in this lifetime. You're having to work for it all the time. That's what the Catholic Church teaches. And those people, though that 85% of so-called churches, if they're honest with themselves, would tell you that the reformers uh, died in vain, that the Reformation was pointless, and uh, that Catholic or Protestant, it makes no difference, they all believe the same gospel. It's really faith and works. If you boil it all down, it's faith and works. And therefore, Luther wasn't necessary, and some of the other reformers weren't necessary either. They weren't perfect men. Those guys had many flaws. And I'm not a Lutheran, I'm not a Calvinist, I don't follow any of those men. But for those that were in the Catholic system, what those guys did was essential. They freed millions of men and women from the bondage of the papacy. Now for me, I'm just a born again Christian. I'm not in any denomination. So I don't need to say, well, no, I don't offer myself as a Protestant either. I'm just a born-again Bible believer. I'm completely independent. But for those people that were in the Catholic Church back in the 16th century, the 15th century, even back, you know, to Wycliffe um, and some of the other greats, you know, pre that, what those guys did was completely essential. It was a miracle. It was an absolute miracle. And Tyndale as well, the wonderful Tyndale, who put the Bible into English, and of course he was murdered by the Church of Rome. 85% of professing churches are in the same camp as the Roman Catholics when it comes to how you get saved. What an abomination. 
But the Bible says that when you get saved, your sin is not imputed to you. When you're born again, you receive Christ's imputed righteousness. And I'll show you an account from uh, the book of Numbers. This is obviously, this is pre the church, but this is a type. This is how I understand uh, the Lord looks at us today. Numbers 24. First of all, a bit of background to this. You've got Balaam, who's been called up by Balak to curse Israel. And Balaam is a, uh, a questionable character, shall we say. And he says to Balak, or Balak, how do you want to pronounce it, I'll only tell you what the Lord tells me, which is to his credit. So he goes along to meet Balak, and uh, he says, I want you to curse Israel for me. Again, Israel is hated by the world. Enmity between the woman and your seed. You saw that from Genesis 3. And that enmity hasn't gone away. You know, Israel has had it for centuries. The church has it. And will always have it until the Lord returns. You know, if you stand for the Lord, you're going to suffer. And uh, your own enemies are going to come from your own family a lot of the time. Never mind your neighbours. Never mind people down the road. Your own family is going to be against you. The Lord said that, didn't he? In John, uh, excuse me, in Matthew chapter 10. Mother against father. Daughter-in-law against father-in-law, etc., etc. Look at Numbers 24. Uh, three times Balaam has been called to curse Israel. And it's a fascinating uh, interaction that these two have. I won't read it all because it's too much text to read. But the third account, but I'll, I'll start it from chapter 23, I think. Uh, chapter 23, and uh, look at verse 21. This is, this is speaking about the Lord, of course, concerning Israel. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. There was so much sin in the camps of Israel. We know that from the Old Testament. But here, the Lord says, no, 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 I don't see any sin. There's no sin at all. Go to chapter 23. Look at verse, uh, sorry, 24, 24. Look at verse 5. How godly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. One more time, excuse me. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O, J o Israel. I've got a bit of a glare here, so please excuse me. He's saying, no, there's no sin in the camp. They're goodly, and their tabernacles are okay. What you're finding here, in a nutshell, is the Lord is looking at Israel, and he's telling Balak, he's saying, there's no sin in Israel. He's covered them with his righteousness, with his goodness, with his kindness. When Satan says to the Lord, look at brother A, look at brother C, or look at sister A, look at sister B, she said this, he did that, the Lord says, no, 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 no. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, tabernacles, O Israel. He doesn't look at the sin of the believer. All your sins have been dealt with at the cross. And the, and the devil says, yeah, but he, he said this, and she said that, and they're going to do this next week. And the Lord says, no, 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 no. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. Now, of course, there was sin in the camp, and he dealt with the sin, as you know. Thousands were put to death. But my point is this. God isn't going to stay, take sides with an unsaved person. He won't allow an unsaved person to blaspheme his people. The Lord knows what sin is around, and he deals with that sin accordingly. But here, Balak is trying to get Balaam to curse Israel and the Lord says forget it they're my people I love them for David's sake I won't see Israel obliterated today the devil tries to blaspheme the saints he says brother A did this sister A did that and the Lord says no for my son's sake they are fine for my son's sake you can't touch them they belong to me you're covered you're covered with an imputed righteousness that was told many times back in the Old Testament God always wanted to save people. He reached out to many people throughout the Old Testament. He stretched out his arm, his hand. He stretched out his whole being to people today. But people don't want to be saved. Mankind doesn't want to believe in the Lord. Mankind is quite happy doing his own thing. And uh, you get people saying, oh, you know, these Christians are hypocrites. Yes, yeah, some of them are. But what does God say? How godly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel? He doesn't look at your sin. He looks at the Lord's imputed righteousness. He sees what Jesus did for you. And all these churches which deny um, imputed righteousness, they're traitors. They've all abandoned true biblical Christianity. And like I say, I'll say it one more time. In essence, they are 
accusing the reformers of dying in vain, for many were put to death for what they stood for, and they say that the Reformation wasn't necessary when it completely was. So let's call this video Whatever Happened to Sin. Uh, this isn't going to be a comprehensive video, it doesn't need to be, but you saw what the Lord said about sins. He was very explicit, and of course the consequence of unrepentant sin, if you're not saved, is a lake of fire, full of eternity. Don't spiritualise hell, don't try and um, allegorise the scriptures. The Bible's very clear. You know, somebody once said, I'm not uh, afraid of what I don't know, I'm afraid of what I do know. And that's true. We are accountable. We know more than we probably should know. And uh, you know, we are expected to reach out to people and get people saved. We can't save people ourselves, of course not. But we are the Lord's vehicles to reach out to unsaved people. And uh, as long as we can, we will make videos. As long as we are able to get online, we'll make videos. Uh, but we're also going to be doing radio as well. And we've already been recording segments to be broadcast from October the 1st. And uh, like I say, our plan, Lord willing, is to cover the whole world eventually. We'll start uh, simple, and we'll start small, and we'll start basic, and we'll build up. We'll see which way the Lord takes it. Um, but uh, as I say, these people that blaspheme the Lord, these people that try and deny the Lord's holiness, His atonement on the cross, they will get theirs. You know, they will stand one day at the great white throne, and they'll be horrified. They'll stand with the atheists, they'll stand with the mockers, they'll stand with the blasphemers, the murderers, the rapists, the adulterers, blah, blah, blah. And they'll be thrown into the lake of fire. I don't wish that on anyone. I really don't. Like I said, I don't have any enemies. You know, the thought of you know somebody who doesn't like me being evicted from their home or losing their job or seeing a loved one die, that doesn't do anything for me at all. You know, if I could stop it, I would, in a flash. But the Lord says, no, you know, if you're not with me, you're against me. You know, I've sent you the Old Testament prophets, I've sent you the New Testament apostles, I gave you the Bible, I've given you evangelists, I've given you this, I've given you that. I've made it possible for everybody to be saved. As I say, the atonement was provided for everybody. The Lord made a provision for everybody to be saved. But only those that appropriate the atonement are going to be saved. Um, you know, so all these people that try and deny it or try and play it down or teach limited atonement or they teach you know, Calvinism, another uh, subject which you know, I've, got, I've got no time for at all. Just offer the, the plan of salvation to anyone and everyone as you can. Uh, don't try and witness to a group of people all at once. Try and do it one by one if you can. Uh, but above all, to stay in the scriptures. Stay close to scripture. Like I said, the Lord is long-suffering. He could have dealt with some of the wicked kings in the Old Testament. Some he did deal with, like I said. But others he left. He let, it run. He let sin run its course. And if you see people today that are, you know, getting up in years and they're living out like the world, you know, and you think, why is this man still alive? Why, why is this woman still alive? Never mind, they'll get their comeuppance. It'll come soon enough. Somebody's probably praying for that person, hence why they haven't yet died. But all the Old Testament kings, all the wicked kings, you know, and some of the uh, other evildoers in the Old Testament, the Lord let them run their course. Sin does run its course. Saul, you know, was, I think, 40 years king of Israel. The Lord didn't step in the moment he failed to deal with the enemies. The Lord didn't step in the moment he spoke to the witch at Endor. He let it run its course, you know, and uh, Samson as well, you know, fornicating. The Lord didn't step in straight away. He let it run its course. And through the evil that these ungod these uh, men were engaged with, some of them were ungodly men, of course, uh, like Manasseh and other Old Testament kings, but some of the sins that the saved people uh, were, you know, delving into, you know, and sort of living in, the Lord used that for good. Like Joseph, sold into slavery, and the Word of God says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. This is why we can't always understand how the Lord works things. We watch the news, you know, we, you know, we read the papers, we, we study the Word of God, we think, why does this happen? Why does the Lord to step in and deal with it straight away? There's a reason for it. He will use evil to bring about his own purpose. Just go back to 1939, you've got people all over the world in turmoil, you got the Third Reich taking over the half, you know, all of Europe, coming for Britain. And if Britain didn't have the Royal Air Force, Britain would have sunk. But praise be to God, the British Air Force was able to 
shoot down Goering's jets and they couldn't take the UK. Also, the Bible, King James. God still blesses parts of this country. There are people in this country which still believe in the word of God. And for those people, the Lord has spared the UK. But once the rapture's been and gone, if there's no believers left in this country, judgment's going to fall very hard. But like I say, 39, 1939, people saying, what's going on here? This man, Hitler, he's conquering Europe. The Japanese are talking about bombing America, blah, blah, blah. And all the pacifists in this country and also in America were saying, let's make a deal with Hitler. Let's make a treaty with him. Let's work with this man. And uh, people were saying, no, 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 don't, you can't trust him. Give him an inch, he'll take a mile. But what was behind that? Ultimately, what was, what was behind that was the creation of Israel. The premillennial Bible believers knew it, but the rest of the world didn't have a clue. And of course, you know the rest. The war was won by the Allies. In 1948, Israel goes back into the land. And she's been there ever since. She's been on a state of emergency since 1948, of course. Again, Genesis chapter 3, I'll put enmity between thy seed and her seed. And that hasn't really gone away, has it? That hasn't vanished. Israel is under attack. The church is under attack. The true born-again Bible believers. Look at the Middle East. Look at, look at these people who are suffering in the Middle East. They're born-again Bible believers. Yes, some Coptics are being put to death. Yes, some Catholics are suffering. And some Anglicans are suffering. But the most people who are suffering are the born-again Bible believers. And they are the people that pray for those people. There are safe people in the Palestinian areas that are praying for their Islamic neighbours. They are praying for their Islamic leaders. Bible-believing Christians don't hate anyone. We don't hate anyone. You know, we're told to pray for those that to persecute us. We're told to intercede for our rulers. And we're told to live peaceably with all people if we can. You don't find Christians going around the world doing their jihads. But you find fundamentalist Islam going around the, going around the world doing their jihad. Why is that? Because they're promised everlasting life. That's the only way to be sure of paradise when they die. Yes, they've been brainwashed. Yes, they've been radicalized. Yes, they feel cut off from society. But nevertheless, they have a foundation for what they do. They do what they do because their holy book, so-called, says if you do it, A, you've dealt with the infidels, B, you've glorified Allah, and C, paradise is waiting for you. And if you're a man, 72 virgins await you. If you're a female bomber, there's no male virgins awaiting you, apparently. Only the guys get it. But um, like I say, we have to step back sometimes and just look at how the Lord allows these things to play out. Nothing happens without a reason. It may seem horrific. It may seem barbaric. It may seem disturbing and distressing. But these things happen for a reason. And I've shown you from the scriptures how the Lord allowed these things to play out he allowed the children of Israel to walk in the wilderness for 40 years. Why? He wanted to deal with all of the unbelieving Jews, all of the reprobates, all of those that caused the children of Israel to stumble, those that created false gods. Aaron stumbled through that, didn't he? Miriam questioned Moses' wife, and she questioned his authority. She was punished with leprosy. And after 40 years, most of those, I think it's 1.8 million Jews that left Egypt, did not go into the Promised Land. Joshua and the others did, of course. But they were, the, they were the next generation. That first generation of Jews which left Egypt didn't make it into the millennium. Moses, the great Moses, didn't make it. Miriam didn't make it. Aaron didn't make it. And Aaron's sons were drunk. And they offered strange fire to the Lord and he dealt with them. He killed them. He will step in when he needs to, and he will deal with sin. So like I say, the main, I guess, crux of this video, the main theme, is to show you very clearly that sin is presently all around us. The Bible teaches it, the Bible shows it very clearly. And uh, don't deny it. You know, if you're born again, don't deny it. And if you're trying to win unsaved people to the Lord, hang in there. It's not easy, it's difficult. Especially when all these fake churches get together and they try and deny the holiness of God. They try to deny everlasting hell. They believe that heaven's forever, but they don't believe that hell is forever. It's the same word in the Bible. Eternal hell, eternal heaven. The new Jerusalem. Why do these people mix it all up? Because they're not of the Lord. They're of another spirit. 
but of course if you're born again you should know these things. So I'm going to sign out now. I uh, think I've said what I wanted to say today. Um, and if you're not saved, you can be saved. You simply come to the foot of the cross and you say, Lord, please be merciful to me, a sinner. True faith, real remorse. Cry out to the Lord as a beggar would do. And say, Lord, please save me. And he reaches out and he grabs you and he saves you and he keeps you saved. You are preserved until the day of redemption. You belong to him, he belongs to you. All this talk about losing your salvation, nonsense. And these churches, these 85% of churches which teach infused righteousness, they also believe once saved you can be lost. No, you can't lose your salvation. That's another subject which comes from Roman Catholicism. Salvation is eternal. Revelation says and Hebrews says um, and the epistles say that he secured our eternal redemption. We are kept saved and all of our past, present and future sins are forgiven. So you may stumble into sin, you may fall into this transgression or that transgression. One more time, Numbers 24. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. Never mind personnel, person B saying this or saying that, you're fine. He sees Jesus Christ, not you. You're saved by what he did for you, not what you do for him. Okay, I'm going to sign out now, and this time I will sign out, and I wish you every blessing, and Maranatha.